Okay, so it's going to be an intro to game physics, uh, pretty basic stuff. I'm also going to be going over somewhat advanced topics too. Uh, also, I'll be doing more. We'll have to see how long this takes. I opted to do this presentation like two days ago, so I've not practiced it at all. Though I never practice presentations, so not been a big surprise. But I uh, just threw this together today, so it might be a little bit rocky. If you have any questions, raise your hand, ask, uh, and Hopefully, I will not overshoot or undershoot drastically on time. Anyways, uh, physics I've done. Uh, I've used ODE, Newton, Bullet. Most of those were in high school. Uh, and then when I got here, we're not allowed to use any of those. But it helps to like have used them uh, so I know a little bit about what a professional physics engine looks like. And then I've used uh, other people's physics engines, like the NAUS physics. Uh, and then I wrote physics for my freshman and senior games. And I wrote Broadface for all my years because I love to write Broadface because it's an optimization and I love optimization. So, uh, most of the physics I've done is pretty hacky physics. So, it's game physics. Uh, I've never done like constraint or impulse space, but I've used constraint and impulse space enough to know that I don't like them very much. Uh, I'll be talking about that a little bit. Uh, so, take everything I have to do, say, uh, with. Uh, constraint or impulse base with a grain of salt because I've never actually done them before. So if you want to know more about those, go to Physics Club because they talk about real physics. Uh, I'm here to talk about hacky game physics. So let's get started. Uh, so common types of physics, tile-based, impulse-based, constraint-based, or your own method-based. Uh, it's completely legitimate to kind of just throw something together yourself and it might not work as well as some of the other ones, but uh, it'll be custom to your game and it'll probably run pretty fast and you'll know it through and through. So uh, there are three main steps to physics, integration, detection, and resolution. I'll be going through the three of them and I'll be talking more about them. Uh, so we start with integration. So basically velocity plus equals acceleration times dt, position plus equals velocity times dt, basic math. That's Euler integration. It's easy to write and understand. It's fast. It's somewhat inaccurate. It's not too inaccurate, like it'll work. But uh, RK4 is going to be a lot more accurate than that. Uh, the reason why it's inaccurate is, so let's say I have an object uh, that is going to go a fairly large um, distance. Really, gravity would be affecting it the entire time it's moving. So its arc would be kind of like this. But in a game, it's just going to move like straight. So gravity won't really be affecting it the entire time. So its traversal will be a little bit different th with Euler. Uh, if you use RK4, it will do a much better job uh, of applying gravity over the over time. Uh, that's what they call integration. But Euler will work fine. You can use it. And it's easy to read. Your teammates will understand what you're doing. I probably won't have too many problems with it. Uh, there's also a fixed time step. So basically, what this is solving is if you have, if your game is running at like 60 FPS and your physics is updating every frame, and then you go down to 30 FPS and your physics is still updating every frame, the way physics works might change a little bit because the DTs are going to be different. This is especially uh, true with constraint based, which you have to tweak a little bit depending on uh, how frequent, frequently you're updating it. So constraint base might work really well at 60 FPS, but then when it drops down to 30, it might act a little bit differently. So the way we solve this is we always update with a fixed time step. So we're going to uh, update like, uh, like 60 times per second. So what this means is if you're running at 30 FPS, you're actually going to be updating twice every frame. or like, let's say you're running 120 FPS. Don't know why you would be doing this, but you would wait once. Like, every, you would only update once every other frame. Here's some simple code to do that. Um, the problem with updating, like, twice every frame is, let's say, uh, I'm 1 over 60, and physics is really expensive. So then I'm running at 30 FPS. I update twice a frame. But then that drops me down to, like, say, 15 FPS. Now I have to update four times a frame. Well, that's super expensive. That drops me down to, like, 8 FPS. And now I have to update even more. And then it just, and then you're dead. Like, your game just keeps going slower and slower because you have to update more and more. Uh, so 
There's really no great solution to that except maybe to drop your fixed time step down or to start your, fix, your time step at 1 over 30 to begin with. But the problem is, if you're running at 30 FPS and your time step is 1 over 60 and you don't update twice every frame, then you're basically frame-based because that means that if you're going 60 FPS, you're updating once every frame at a fixed time step of 1 over 60. And if you're 30 FPS, you're still only updating once per frame at a time step of 1 over 60. So your game will run differently. Uh, so you basically have to make sure that if your time step is 1 over 60, that you update twice if you're running at 30 FPS. Uh, so it depends on how fast your physics is. If you're worried about your physics being super slow, then you probably want your time step to be 1 over 30. The higher or the smaller, I guess, your time step is, the more accurate your physics will be. So it's kind of a trade-off. Uh, so here are some common primitive types. So points, spheres, tile maps, ABBs, rays, segments. Segments are like lines. So rays are something that starts somewhere and then shoots infinitely in a direction. A segment has a defined start and end point. OBB, so ABB is a box that's not rotated. So they call it axis aligned box, axis aligned bounding box. So it is aligned to the axes and it's not rotated. Uh, OBB is oriented bounding box, so it's a rotated box. OBB is going to be a lot harder to check than an ABB. ABB is going to be a lot faster. Then convex polygon, that means it's a polygon that has no dips in it. And a concave polygon is one that kind of dips in. The way you can check this is if you can draw a line through the object and have it touch more than two faces, then that means it's concave. So let's get my wallet here. So if my wallet's closed, I can draw a line and have it through it at a lot of places and have it only check two, so like a box. Anywhere you draw a line through it, it's only going to go in one place and come out one place. So if I open my wallet up, then I can draw a line here. It goes in here, comes out here, goes in there, goes out there. That means it's concave because I can draw a line and it goes in and out more than once. Uh, concave polygons are, most of the time we don't even deal with those in physics because they're so hard to check against. So what you can do is you can actually take it and break it into two convex polygons. So I could cut my wallet in half here, and then I would have two convex polygons, and then we could check those. But these are going to be more expensive than anything above them. Uh, I've put these in the order, the relative order of how expensive they are to check. It's not exact, but uh, oh yeah. And uh, if you're looking, so I'm not going to be talking about primitive versus primitive checks, so like circle versus OBB because that's a lot of math. I don't have time for that. It's all in real-time collision detection, though. There's a whole chapter that is like almost every single one of these versus almost every single other one. The math is optimized. He explains it really well. So if you're interested in that, get the book. These algorithms are also strangely difficult to find on the internet. And if you do find them, they probably will not be optimized very well, or they'll be wrong in ways that are hard to detect. So save yourself the trouble, get the book if you're going to be doing physics. Broad phasing. So when we're talking about uh, collision detection, uh, so there's the narrow phase and the broad phase. So the narrow phase is the one object against another, usually pretty expensive. But the problem is if we just check every object against every other object, that's going to be very slow. Uh, o of n squared to be exact, if you know uh, big O notation. So if you have basically a thousand objects, then it's a thousand like squared basically is how many checks you're going to have to do. And it's going to slow you down very fast. So broad phase will give us pairs of objects that are close to one another. So now we run it through the broad phase. We get all these pairs of objects that are relatively close to one another. And then we only check those. So instead of checking every object against every other, we have this much more optimal thing we can do. So then once you have the pairs, you do the narrow phase. Uh, <clears throat> so there are many, many broad phases. The book talks about some of them, but I'm going to focus on uniform grid, implicit grid, trees, and uh, sword and sweep, or sweep and prune. The book calls it sword and sweep. People around here sometimes call it sweep and prune. Same thing. Uh, 
So trees. So basically with a tree, we're going to break the object in, <clears throat> we're going to start at like one big world and then divide it into two basically. So the root node will then tree to two smaller nodes. Each of those will tree into two smaller nodes, so on and so forth. It's pretty complicated. I can't go into the details, but I can tell you what's good about this and what's bad about it so that you kind of know what problems you might run into. Uh, it's good for objects of varying size. So basically, if you have a huge object, it can be at the top of the tree. And then the smaller objects will go smaller into the tree. So when you want to check something, you start at the top of the tree, you check against everything in the top of the tree, then you go down one node, check everything in there, go down and go down. So this way it works with objects of many different sizes, which is something grids choke on. It can also handle large levels with ions. Uh, so what I'm talking about is if you have like a cluster of objects over here and a cluster of objects way over here and not too much in between them, the tree will handle that pretty well. Whereas a grid, it'll be spending memory on this empty space and some of the other uh, broad faces will have trouble with that too. Some problems with trees are you have to worry about balancing. I'm not sure if any of you have used any trees, but when they split, sometimes they, uh, like ABB trees, will have they'll be kind of weighted to one size side of the tree when you start inserting things and deleting things. Uh, and that's a really tricky problem to solve. Uh, expensive and sometimes there's really just no great way to do it. Uh, can often be slower than grid solutions. There are things that trees are good at, but when a grid's good at something, it's usually faster than a tree, just because the memory is all nice and contiguous uh, and grids, you can hit into them directly if they work, where you don't have to traverse any through anything. They're harder to write and use. Trees are still pretty easy to write, but once you start worrying about the balancing, like if you look at Bullet's code for balancing their AABB tree, it's ridiculous. If you look at Chris Peters' code for balancing his AABB code, it's also ridiculous, uh, and you just don't have to worry, with that, worry about balancing with grids. Uh, sweep and prune. This is uh, another cool one. So I'm actually going to, well, I'll talk about it and I'll explain how it, how it works. So infinite bounds. So your world has no defined size with sweep and prune. It can be infinitely large. Uh, relatively low memory consumption compared to trees. Trees can start to get up into memory consumption uh, just with all their nodes. Uh, easy to write and understand. Some problems is it can be slow. And normally, sweep and prune is only done along one axis. So let's say you have these gr things in a stack. Uh, since it's only kind of, you'll see in a little bit, checking along one axis, it'll produce all these things in a stack. It'll, you'll have to check against all of them in the narrow phase. So that can be slow. There are ways you can expand sweep and prune to do more than one axis, but they're non-trivial. The book doesn't even go over them. It just always does it along one axis. Uh, so let's move this up a little bit. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to talk about sweep and prune down here. So let's say we have this going on. So we have these boxes. If uh, sweep and prune works mostly with ABBs, actually with ABBs, so if you have something that's not an ABB, like this polygon here, you want to make an ABB around it for sweep and prune to work on. Most of the broad faces work like this. Even if you have a shape that's not an ABB, you just make an ABB that bounds it, and then that's what the broad face works on. So this could be a circle here. We just put an ABB around it. This could be some like weird triangle shape. We just put an ABB around it. But all the sweep and prune cares about is the axis line bounding box that are fitting these. So what we do is we kind of project down to an axis. So we say this shape starts here and ends here. This shape starts here and ends here. This shape starts here and ends here. So we start at this guy's, and we put this into like a linked list or an array, and then we sort these based on how far they are along here. So then what we can do uh, is we can say, so start here and then go to the next one. 
And is that my end? It's not his end, it's this guy's start, which means that this guy is intersecting with him along that axis. So now we can check these two in our narrow phase. Uh, and then he ends, so we kind of pop him off. And then we go along here to see if there's anybody who starts, but there's not. And then this end, then we do the same thing here and end there. Uh, so everybody understand how that works? So where this starts to get expensive is the sort can get expensive. Uh, sorting is an expensive algorithm. It can also, as you see, like if you had a stack of things, it's not going to work very well if you're projecting down to this axis because they're all going to have to check against one another. Uh, you could try to intelligently choose an axis. So like if you had this stack and you projected this direction instead, then sweep and prune would work a lot better. <coughs> or what you could do is project down to both axes and do both and then kind of merge the results. Uh, the book doesn't go over that. Technically, that could be possible. It's very similar to what implicit grid does. But that would probably consume a lot more memory. There would be overhead related to that. Uh, sweep and prune's good. We did it in Nouse, and it ended up being very slow, and we switched to implicit grid. Uh, we weren't using an intrusive linked list, though. We were using a standard list. Standard list is a pretty slow data structure. Maybe if we used intrusive list or an array, we would have had better results. But uh, ever since that, I'm a little bit wary of using sweep and prune because it didn't go very well for us. Uh, so then we get to implicit grid. Implicit grid is by far my favorite broad phase. Uh, it doesn't work in all situations, but when it works, it works really, really well. It is a grid. So you have a grid of fixed size cells. <clears throat> uh, so it's good for objects of varying size because an object can be in as many cells as it wants with implicit grid. So if an object covers multiple cells, it'll just be placed in all those cells. Uh, it's recreated every frame, so if you have a lot of objects that's moving around, there's absolutely no overhead for that. Uh, because in, the implicit grid is wiped and everything is reinserted into it every frame. A downside is that it has limited bounds. Since it's a grid, you have to choose where it starts and where it ends and how large you want your cells to be. So if you want it to span a really large world, it could start consuming a lot of memory. What we ended up doing in Nouse and Rhinopocalypse is the grid is centered around the player. Since it's recreated every frame, we can also move it every frame. So it's centered around the player. All objects outside the grid, we, they're just like, oh, they're too far away from the player. The player's probably not even seeing them. And we basically don't run physics on them. Works pretty well, actually, uh, especially in Nouse. Like, once they're outside the grid, it's like, we don't care about them anymore. Uh, they just keep shooting into infinity. And they don't collide against anybody. Um, there could be some problems with that, but as long as you know it's happening, you can account for it. Uh, <clears throat> so it's very, very fast. It uses little memory. It does choke if you get over 1,000 objects. It actually starts choking like 700 objects, and then once you get over 1,000, it's like, ah starts having trouble. But if you have fewer than that, it's going to run super fast. Um, the problem is this is pretty, it, it basically uses bit manipulation in a really cool way uh, to make this thing work. I hope I have time to talk about it at the end of this presentation, but I'm worried if I talk about it now, I'll run way over time. It's in the book. You could also ask me about it afterwards. Uh, but just know that it exists and that when you have fewer than 1,000 objects and you don't care about this limited bounds thing, it's amazing. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully I'll have time to work it in at the end of the presentation, though. Anyways, interfacing with gameplay. So a lot of times gameplay code is going to want to know about collisions. So like a bullet hits the player, it's going to want to know about that. The nice thing to do is to give the gameplay messages only on start and stop collision. Uh, some of the like in the beginning of now, so we would send a message every frame that two things were touching. That ended up being bad, especially since we had a scripting language. So we would send this message, and it would go to a scripting language every frame. So now this scripting language is getting hit all the time, and scripting languages are slow. So it actually ended up being a bottleneck. Uh, so then we switched it so it would only tell it when it started a collision and when it stopped a collision. And then this 
scripting language wasn't getting hit enough and our frame rates went up. Uh, and it was also nicer to deal with just in a game design way. Uh, so what I do is I have a hash map of all the current collisions. So basically a pair of one of the a pointer to the one of the people is colliding and a pointer to the other or like a game object ID or something. Uh, and then so when I had a collision, I looked into the hash map and if that collision was in the hash map, then that meant that they were colliding last frame and I wouldn't send out the message. Uh, and then I would also keep track of which did collide that frame and then I would go through the hash map and any that weren't in the hash map from this frame and were in the hash map from the prior frame, then I would know that the collision had stopped and I would send out a message for that. Uh, that works very well. One thing you want to make sure of is, let's say um, object A is colliding with object B and you put that into the hash map and then B collides with A the next frame. For, so for whatever reason, they've reversed order. You do have to make sure that you still realize that's the same collision. So A colliding with B is the same as B colliding with A. So what you can do is if you're using pointers, you can just put the, uh, the lower pointer first and the higher pointer second. And then so even if they swap orders internally somehow, you'll figure it out. And the lower pointer will always be first and the higher one will be second in the hash map uh, pair. Tunneling. Uh, so this is a problem with games where if an object moves too far in a frame, it can just go through things. So like, let's say the object starts here and ends here. We only check at discrete intervals. So he'll just go straight through this table and not detect that. There are some ways you can fix this. Uh, not all of them are amazing. What you can use, do is sweep or use a line segment test. There are a way. There is an algorithm, so you can have two spheres and say, I have one sphere, it starts here, ends here, another sphere that starts here and ends here. Tell me the exact point at which they, are, they collide. There's an algorithm to do that. It only really works very well with spheres. Uh, I think you can also do it with boxes, but definitely wouldn't work very well with polygons. Uh, another thing is, let's say you have a bullet. You could just approximate the bullet by a point and then draw a line and do a line segment test, and that's basically a sweep. So like the bullet, if you have it here and then here, you draw a line to, through where it went, and then you'll see that it hits the table. Another thing you can do, and I did this in Rhinopocalypse, if the rhino moves really far from like here to here, I'll actually update him in small steps, checking as I go. That doesn't always work, but it worked in Rhinopocalypse. Uh, and since my update was pretty fast and my collision checks were pretty fast, I actually update the Rhino about 100 times every frame. And it's so cheap that I just don't even see a cost from that. And so he never goes through anything. And if he moves farther, I just always move him in the same increments. Or you could change your gameplay. If something's moving really fast, you could just tell the game designer, oh, that missile can't move that fast. And he might not be happy, but that might just be how it has to be. Uh, not the winning solution, but it is a solution. Oh, another thing you can do is you can make the, uh, your bounding boxes like artificially large is another thing you can do, like larger than the object themselves. Like, so if you have a missile, you could have its bounding box like extend like further back or further forward, so it's less like, likely to tunnel. That might have other adverse side effects, but it might fix the problem. It might not be noticeable. Or the player might be happy because their missile would hit something when they weren't exactly sure that it would. Sometimes it's nice to make the player's attacks a little bit larger than they look so the f player doesn't feel like they're getting cheated. Uh, kind of err on the side of helping the player rather than hurting them. Uh, so there's a few other tricks when it comes to collision detection. You can mark objects that don't move as static and then you don't have to check them against one, e one another. There's also other optimizations you can do, like with the broad phase, you can, like if you ha have a broad phase that doesn't get recreated every frame, like the implicit grid, it might help with that. You could just keep them in the broad phase and you know that they're never gonna move around. Uh, <clears throat> you can also, it's good to have a way, who, uh, a way to mark who can collide with who. The way we did this is we had layers. So I could be like, so everybody's on layer zero and then you could optionally put them on other layers. So it's like the player would be on layer one, bullets would be on layer two, like enemies would be on layer three. And then the player could be like, I don't collide with layer one, 
layer one. Uh, it, <clears throat> and it's nice to give names to the layers just for the game designer, so you don't have to remember bullets are layer two. You can say like bullets, and then it hash maps to what the idea is. Uh, but it's good to use bitwise operations for that, just for speed. So basically, each bit can be a layer. And then to check who can collide with who, you just bitwise and them together. And then you, like bitwise the, and the layers that this guy can't collide with, with, with the layers this guy is on. And then you get your result out very fast in uh, one up. And you can also use the Orange Book to find optimized math. Uh, it's good to write the math yourself, I think, just so you have a good understanding of it. A lot of these collision detection routines, you can be like, oh, I know how to write that. But you should also take a look in the Orange Book, because sometimes he has little tricks uh, to help out. Like one thing I was doing is to generate an OBB from an ABB. I was just taking every point and rotating it, and then making the ABB or the OB ABB out of those rotated points. But it turns out, if you just take the so like the extents of the OBB, and you multiply it by the rotation matrix abst. So you take the absolute value of every value in the rotation matrix, and you multiply it by your extents, it will give you the ABB. Ta-da, super fast, only one matrix multiplication. I just found that out because I'm like, there's gotta be a faster way to do this. And I saw I researched a little bit, and it's like, ta-da, there is. So it's always good to look around for optimized math on the internet or in the book because there is fast, fast math out there. Resolution. So now we get to the hardest phase. There is really no perfect solution for any of this resolution stuff. Uh, as we'll find, like you'll have, you'll see games, like even really professional games, sometimes objects will just be inside one another and then they'll like start freaking out. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen this, where something gets inside something else, and then brrr, they go crazy. Uh, even professional games will have this happen. The reason is there's just like no great solution to it. Uh, there's just all right solutions. So let's talk about constraint-based. Uh, I don't know too much about this, but I've used a few constraint-based engines enough to, and I've read some papers on it. Uh, it uses pretty complicated math. Uh, I've heard it's basically rocket science at this point to solve big problems like stacking and chains. Uh, let's move up here and I can show you why stacking is so problematic. So, let's say we have a stack of boxes here. And we're going to update these. So we integrate them so they're all falling down due to gravity. So now this guy's inside the ground. That guy's there on top of him. This guy's there on top of him. OK, so we have to solve this problem. So which of these guys updates first? Let's say this guy checks his collision first. Well, he's like, oh, I'm not colliding against anybody. Then this guy updates. He's like, oh, I'm not colliding against anybody. This guy updates. He's like, oh, I'm colliding against the ground. So then he updates to be outside of the ground. But suddenly, he's inside of that guy. And we're already done checking our collision, so we probably won't even notice that this happened. Or the, another bad thing that could happen is uh, this guy could update first. He resolves up into the, the other guy, who then resolves <clears throat> up into the other guy. And if you're, sometimes your physics will see that as kind of a velocity gain, and then these guys will go springing up. Uh, you'll often get a spring effect with this sort of thing, where the, they all like squish into another and then get pushed out and like go springing everywhere. Especially with constraint-based, if you're not doing it properly, you'll get this crazy spring effect. But constraint-based does have the possibility of fixing the stacking issue. Uh, if you're not doing some sort of thing to resolve that, where they'll get resolved up into one another, it just won't work. Uh, also, chains are tricky. So if you have chains of objects all tied to one another, that's going to be a tricky solution to fix. Uh, constraint base will do that. Does that by resolving iter iteratively. So it does like multiple attempts to resolve every frame. 
So you can actually improve the quality of constraint base by improving the number of iterations every frame. So you can tell a game is using constraint based is if I can manage to get this chair inside the ground somehow, you'll see it get pushed out very slowly over multiple frames. Or it could be fast, but it'll still take a few frames and it'll get pushed out. If you see that happening, that usually means that the game's constraint based. Uh, the nice thing about this is it's not as jarring to the eye. Whereas if something is stuck in the ground and it tries to pop out immediately, that will be a lot more jarring to the eye. And you'll get the games where they'll pop out and then they'll have popped into something else and then they'll pop back and then and then you have this thing that's like flipping out. Uh, constraint base would fix that. <clears throat> uh, the math is very clean. It's not very hacky. Mathematician types really like constraint based because it's not, there's still hacks involved, but it's not going to be as bad as some of the other ones we're going to look at. So, and it seems like the perfect solution to everything, but it's not really the perfect solution to everything. It is expensive. It's one of the most expensive ways to resolve. Uh, it's not very good for character controllers. Even if you're doing this for most of your physics, you're not going to want to do it for your character controller. You're going to want some special thing for your character controller. Uh, I mean, I've had many character controllers that try to use uh, constraint base, and you'll get the problem where, like, in now, the player could go through a wall, no problem, because he would be pushing against it, and the constraint base would be trying to push him back. But, like, if you figured out a way to get enough force where the constraint base couldn't push you back fast enough, bam, you're through the wall. Um, and then now starts yelling at you. He's like, get back in the stage. You're not supposed to be out there. And uh, that's not good. <coughs> Difficult to get right. This is one of the harder things to implement. Now, people have done it at DigiPen, but there are still like, slight problems. Like Even if you get something that you feel is working, it's probably not working as well as like a professional one like Havoc. Uh, Havoc actually does release most of their source code, but they don't release most of their constraint-based stuff because they don't want to people to know how they did it because it's that hard to do. Uh, and it takes a lot of tuning. Like I was saying, constraint-based is a little bit picky about the time step it gets. So it's that point where if you give it a different time step, it'll start working slightly differently. Ah, so it does take a lot of tuning. Once you get it right, it can work pretty well. But it's a very uh, touchy algorithm. Impulse-based. Cheaper than constraints. I actually don't know too much about this one. But it is an alternative to constraint base that does exist. It can do stacking, but more hacks are required. I also saw an impulse based one uh, that did chains. There's a, a DigiPen game that was released a while back. I forget which one it is, but it consists of this guy running around with a chain, like hitting people. Uh, it was impulse based and it did get a chain working. But there are going to be more hacks involved than a constraint based one. The math isn't going to be like as perfect. Uh, it's going to take probably even more tuning, and it's still not that great for a character controller. So the problem is that both of these are pretty slow. They don't work well for character controllers. They take a long time to implement, and they probably won't work as well as you had hoped. Uh, they will work well, but there will, like, you'll never get away from objects being inside one another and having to be pushed out. It'll still happen. Uh, for the scope of a DigiPen game, I really wouldn't recommend this, unless you are really gung-ho about being a physics programmer. Uh, I mean, and you just want to do it for fun. That's like the reason to do this, but it takes so much time and it's so hard to get right that it might hurt your gameplay. Like your character might not feel right. It'll take so long that it might take like a full semester to get your physics working. And until that point, your, the rest of your team is having to deal with physics that's always changing. These sort of things are a big problem. Uh, also, one thing to point out is that it is fairly difficult to get a job uh, in the industry as a physics programmer. Same with like an engine dev. Uh, so you have to take that into account. Like if you're going to be doing physics stuff, you may want to look into learning something else as well, just in case you can't get a job as a physics developer, uh, so that you can get a job doing something else. Uh, because there's Havoc out there, there's Bullet, these are very good physics engines. They don't hire too many people to work on their physics stuff because they've basically got a handle on it. Uh, and most of the other teams just hire the Havoc and Bullet people. Now, you can maybe get a job 
uh, helping integrate Havoc and Bullet with another engine, but it there's not as it, the jobs are not as plentiful as maybe like a graphics programmer or a gameplay programmer, uh, tools programmer out there. So just keep that in mind if you want to spend a large portion of your time at DigiPen learning physics. Uh, like I spent, I wanted to be an engine dev, but I knew that I might not be able to get a job as an engine dev, so I picked up graphics as well as my secondary thing, and that is what I ended up getting a job doing is graphics. I still love engine dev, but Unity's out there, Unreal's out there, they don't hire too many people, and if they do, they're usually pretty senior, so it's hard to get a job there. Uh, Oh, so then there's tile-based. So you guys might have heard about this. I think you program in 2.30. Uh, it's actually surprisingly good. Uh, it can work. We used it for Rhinopocalypse, and it worked really well. Uh, the nice thing about it is it's good for character controllers. You can get a character controller that feels controls well. It's pretty easy for the designer to mess around with. It's easy to implement. It's easy to understand. It's very fast because it's a tile. So basically, you're just hitting into the tile grid with these points. Uh, so there's no traversing of trees or anything like that. Very, very fast. Uh, level creation is also fast and easy. Outside of physics entirely, it's a lot easier to make a tile-based level editor. I wish we did it for Naus. And Naus, our level editor, we just didn't have enough time to spend on it. And I wish we could have just had a tile-based level editor because they're so easy to make. And then our designer would have been a lot happier with our editor. So outside of physics entirely, tiles are very, very nice from a gameplay perspective. And a lot of people don't realize that when they're the physics programmer and they're not really thinking about gameplay concerns, or even I didn't think about that in now, so I just wanted to like do like, I was like, man, tile base, that's too easy. We want to be awesome. But at the end of the day, I should have just gone with what was easy, which was tile based, and our lives would have been a lot better. Uh, there is a little bit of hackiness in here, especially, especially when you go into 3D, you run into some problems. But as I was talking about with Rhinopocalypse, where I step him along, Tilebase is so fast, so ludicrously fast that I can afford to do that. I can afford to be like, oh man, it's a little bit hacky, but you know, to like reduce tunneling and stuff like that, I'll just update him 100 times every frame. And it only still takes like 1% of our uh, frame time physics. So it's very, very fast. Uh, and you can also like write your own. Um, I might, it is a little bit tricky. I don't want to suggest writing your own too much because it is, physics is a very, very hard problem. Uh, and You'll get into problems like what that stacking problem that you may not even realize until it starts happening. Uh, there's so many problems out there. So it is good to find something that is kind of done before. Uh, but at the end of the day, I can't help but recommend tile-based just because it's super easy uh, and it works pretty well. And graphically, you can you might think the tiles look kind of bad, but you can do some graphics tricks to make them look better. Like if you have a whole bunch of tiles, you can kind of merge them graphics wise so that you can't even see that they're tiles. Uh, like if you look at gear, it did some tricks with that, where you can kind of still tell that gear's tile based, but they did make it look really, really good. So I'd recommend it. Let's see how much time we have. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Rhino Apocalypse, just as kind of a, uh, example of an applied example of physics and some of the problems you might run into. So, <clears throat> with Run Apocalypse, uh, it's a voxel based game. So our world consists of a lot, a lot of voxels. So it's 3D. So you look at voxels, the first thing you think of is this should be tile based. Uh, then you have this huge rhino. The rhino is about like five times larger than the voxels this way and like 18 times larger than the voxels in this way. So I was really worried, like what happens if he gets stuck like between two things, like he falls into this hole somehow where he is larger than the hole. You get into some problems where a lot of physics would try to resolve him this way and then they would try to like resolve him back that way and then you got this thing or if you were lucky, it would figure out a way to pick, pull him up. But with uh, tile-based, 
usually using hit points. So you're like hit, hitting once into the tile, like is there a tile here? And then if there is, you try to find which way to push them out. So at the end of the day, we approximated the rhino with a single point that's like kind of near his front legs. What this means is that technically, the rhino can get his butt into a wall because there's absolutely nothing physics-wise, like it's just this point near his front legs. There's nothing on his butt. So he can easily get his butt into the wall. But the way he turns in the game, that actually doesn't happen very often because he turns in a sort of way where he will hit with his legs first and then kind of stop turning. So you actually don't, unless you are trying to make it happen, his butt doesn't get into the wall very much. Uh, and what we gain from just that single point is that the physics resolves pretty well. It's very fast. And there are not that many cases where you can just straight up go into a wall. There's a few ways you can do it, but they're really my fault, and I need to fix them, not uh, the core physics's fault. Uh, it was also pretty easy to do. So what I would do is let's say I'm in this uh, thing here, and the point checks here. So the point is here. It's like, oh, I'm inside something. I would find like the closest edge, and then I would push it out that way. This doesn't always work, though, because let's say the rhino is running. So he's running in this direction. Here's this little point that's the rhino, and he gets like in here. Well, now it'll be like the closest edge is there, so I'll push him over into this one. Oh no, so he's still in something. So what I actually did is once I pushed, I'll check, is he still in something? And then if he was still in something, I'll move him back and then try the other way. That actually worked. The only time it doesn't work is, let's say, uh, you have a corner or... Uh, what is this thing? I don't think anybody needs this. Uh, <coughs> hopefully not, at least. Let's say you have a corner, and the rhino gets his nose in here. So now I try to go out this way. There's still something there. I try to go out this way. There's still something there. Then I would do both. Solved it. That little trick right there did it. Like, it works. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty hacky. You're like, man, that doesn't seem like it should work. But when you're only moving, moving him like really small increments, it means that he's never going to jump straight through a voxel. He's never even going to get this far into one. He's always just going to get a little bit into a voxel, and then I'll detect the collision and get him out. <clears throat> and another thing to note is when you like, if he's here and he goes into here, you can't just move him back where he was. You have to move him out this way because he needs to be able to slide along the wall. So, like, if I go he like, start running against the wall, which I would never do in real life, I'll start, like, sliding along it. And you want that to happen in your game. If you just take me and you move me back to where I was when I stick, I won't, I won't slide because you'll be always moving me back to where I was. But if you push me back out like this, then I'll slide along the wall. And that's what you want. Uh, so that's the core of the Rhino uh, Apocalypse um, physics. Also, Rhino Apocalypse is a 3D game. But the Rhino actually never rotates this way. He always rotates around the Y. So I was able to make most of the physics actually 2D. So we actually do have separating axis for the rhino versus other big objects. But since none of them ever rotate except any the up axis, that means it's basically a 2D check. So think about what you're going to do in your gameplay. And I, I asked Brett, I'm like, are we ever going to rotate it except anything around the Y axis? And he's like, oh, when the enemies die, they kind of go shooting up. And I'm like, do we need collision when they're shooting up like that? And he's like, no. And so like, OK, we can rotate them like that. But as soon as you do that, I'm turning off collision. Uh, so now they only rotate like this. It made our lives easier. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about implicit grid. OK. Uh, we have like 10 more minutes here. So implicit grid is really, really awesome. So let's imagine we have 32 objects. Uh, this is a nice number for implicit grid. 
Uh, you can go more with it than input with it, but uh, 32 is a good number. So it is a grid. So let's draw a grid here. You have to choose uh, the, size, the cell size you want, and you have to choose where the grid's going to be located. And it doesn't go infinitely. So let's say we have here, it's a pretty small grid. Just goes from here to here. If any object's outside of this grid, it's not going to work with our broad face. So we're just going to have to like ignore it. Something like that. If an object's out here, it's like, oh, you're outside the grid. We just ignore you. But implicit grid starts for every one, for every column and row, we have a uint. Or actually, let's say we have four objects. Just smaller number. 32 is pretty large. Uh, so we have a uint. Or you can say four bits. So these four bits, they're all set to zero. So you can't actually have four bits. Uh, so we'll have a larger thing, but we're only using four. And they're all set to zero. So four bits for every column and four bits for every row. So we put a cube down here. So what he's going to do is go across all the columns, and he's going to set the first bit. So what that's saying is I am the first object, so I'm setting the first bit in here. And then he's going to go along his rows and also set the first bit. OK, so now let's put another object in here. So let's imagine he goes along the rows first. So he's actually going to see, oh, uh, the first bit is set here. So he's going to go 1, 0, 0, 0. So the first, he's remembering that the first bit was set here. And then after he remembers that, he's going to set himself into there. Then he'll go here. The first bit is also set. So he'll add that here, but the first bit's already set. So you can do that with a binary or. So like, let's say this third bit was set. You would binary or it in. So this one would get set over here. But that's not set, so that doesn't happen. And then after that, he adds himself in. So then he starts going along his columns. He takes this, and he's remembering that, 0, 0, 0, 0, so nobody. And then he puts himself here. And let's imagine there was a 1 here again. He would take that and bitwise or it in here. Like that, that's what would happen if that bit was set, but it's not set, so that doesn't happen. And then he adds himself to there. And then what he does is he takes these two. So he's like, basically what it's doing is it says, oh, object one is in the rows. So he knows that he could be colliding with object one, but it's not in the columns. So basically what he's seeing here is, oh, it's in the same rows as me, but it's not in the same column. So he's going to bitwise and these together, and the result is 0, 0, 0, 0, which means that he's not colliding with anybody. So the broad face has done its work. Now this object knows that there's no way he's colliding with him. Ta-da! Now let's actually get a case where there is a collision. Well, it's actually not a collision, but the broad face is still going to detect it's going to send this to the narrow phase. So when the broad phase has a pair of objects, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily colliding. It just means that they might be. So you have to test them. So he's going to go, same thing here. He's going to look into his, oh, we forgot to add him over here. He's going to go into the row 1, 1, 0, 0. And that's the only row that he's in. He adds himself. Then he's going to go into the columns. And he's going to remember the, his columns. And he's going to add himself in there too. And then he's going to bitwise and these together. And the result will be 0, 1, 0, 0 when we bitwise and. Whoa, I did that. Uh, and so then what you have to do is there's actually an intrinsic in Visual Studio or like the CL compiler. There's probably an intrinsic in other compilers because there's a, a assembly instruction that's bit scan. 
So you can say bit scan, uh, and basically what it'll do is it will go through the bits and return you the index of the first one that's set. So if I set called bit scan on this, it would return one, which means that it's the first, I mean, if we count this as the zero bit, this is the first bit, it'll give me back one, which means that's the bit that's set, which means that I know that I am potentially colliding with that guy, and then I just go into the narrow phase between me and him. And then what I do is I remove this bit, and then I bit scan again. Because let's say there was two objects here. Like let's say our result was this, one, zero, one, zero, one. Bit scan would first give me one, and I'll mass this out again, call bit scan again, and then it would give me three. And then I'd go. So I just keep bit scanning and removing until we get all zeros again. Ta-da! That <laughs> that's implicit grid. The reason it's so fast uh, is because bi uh, bitwise operations are really really fast. Uh, they're basically one ops, all of them fast operations at that. And it actually doesn't take that much memory because all the memory is used for columns and rows, but there's no individual cell memory. So like a lot of grids will have like a linked list in every cell or an array in every cell, which means that like if your grid is like 10 by 10, that means that you have 100 cells. With this, there's no per cell memory, so instead of 10 by 10, it's like 10 plus 10 is the amount of memory that you're using here. The, uh, like 10 by 10, 10 plus 10 times the size of whatever one cell is, or whatever one column or row is, which is the number of objects. Uh, so like n objects. Uh, over 8. So the number of objects over 8 is how many bytes you need for this to work per column or row. So this is why I said with implicit grid, when you get uh, over 1,000 objects, it's going to start falling apart because it's going to require a lot of bytes for every column and every row. And that means when you do these bitwise ands, like here we just had to do one bitwise and because we only had four objects. If you had 64 objects, you'd have to do two bitwise ands for each of the uints uh, to get them. If you had like 1,000, you might have to do like 30 bitwise ands. Strangely enough, it's super fast even when you get like 500 objects. So you would be like, man, that's a lot of bitwise ands. But the thing is, it's a lot of bitwise ands, and they're like the fastest thing you can do. So uh, also make sure that like this entire thing is contiguous in memory. This is all contiguous in memory. If you have everything be close together in memory, super fast algorithm here. Uh, we use this in Nous and we use it in Rhino. Uh, in Nous we moved from sweep and prune over to implicit grid and we never really had a broad phase performance problem ever again. Uh, we had a problem with narrow phase because sometimes the objects would like clump all together. Like, if you have 100 objects all like on top of each other, your broad face isn't going to help you at all because they're all on top of each other. And so sometimes the enemies would like attack the player and the way now work, they were like blobs and they would all attack the player and like crunch on top of him and then it's like, oh, guess we have to check every one against every other one and then it would fall apart there. But the way you can solve that is if you do have a constraint-based engine, make sure it doesn't allow things to crunch together like they did in NAS. Our constraint-based engine was a little bit, it didn't resolve super quickly. Uh, but not all of them do. Uh, any questions out there about anything? There's another orange book that the physics club suggests. Yeah. And it kind of goes over not just collision detection, but yeah. The whole game engine in general. Have you read that? Uh, so I own that, and I have read a little bit of it, but not too much. Uh, uh, the physics programmer in Naus did read it, and he liked he he gave it a meh review. Uh, 
he said it was all right, but he said it, it kind of didn't explain everything. So I mean, it, that's kind of a secondhand review, but that's all I've got. Does this book go over an uh, this? No, this just goes over mostly collision detection. The other problem with, with this book is it won't always give you um, penetration depth. So especially with this uh, book's OBB versus ABB, so let's say you have this, the book will say, yes, these two are colliding, but it won't give you this right here, like this penetration depth. So how, like what axis that's along and how deep it is, because that's what you need to get this guy out, uh, is you need that penetration depth. Or something else that like uh, constraint base will need is it'll need the points at which they're touching. Uh, so collision points, it won't give you that either, uh, the book. Now separating axis can give it to you, but the book's separating axis is very, very optimized just to tell you if they're colliding or not, not to give you that. Uh, so the only solution is really to add it to the book, which you can do. Um, yeah. Separating axis isn't too hard to brain. Well, it is actually kind of hard to brain yourself, like figure it out. But I think it's a good experience. So it's a good learning experience. Yeah. Yeah, it builds character. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they'll definitely have a nice way to visualize because when separating axis goes wrong, it doesn't always go wrong in a super noticeable sort of way. Rhinos was wrong for like two months and we did not know at all because it mostly worked, mostly. Uh, so you want to have a nice way where you can have two boxes and rotate them and then go like, bump and I'll like see it happen, like super controlled. Uh, is everything with physics is very touchy and like graphics when it goes wrong you might not know graphics is notorious it's like man my normals have been wrong this entire time how did I not see that uh, yeah yeah like most most of what I've seen people do is they'll have like two boxes and they'll just have keys that can rotate the boxes and move them and then they'll just like eyeball it and then they'll like move everything closer together. And then when they touch, like they turn red or something and yeah, that sort of thing. Okay, uh, I guess that's good. Uh, I'm also probably thinking about doing a talk on graphics uh, sometime one or two weeks. I guess summer starts, but uh, at some point here and the school closes down, I'm also not sure what lectures we have planned, but if anybody has questions about graphics, come ask me and I will cognize them for my graphics lecture that I hope to do. Yeah. Thank you.